Fa Xian had been living in Chang'an, deploring the mutilated and imperfect state of the collection of the Books of Discipline. In the second year of the period Huang Qi, he entered into an engagement with Huai King, Tao Ching, Huai Ying, and Huai Wei that they should go to India and seek for the disciplinary rules. Li Hao, the prefect of Tan Huang, had supplied them with the means of crossing the desert before them, in which there were many evil demons and hot winds. Travelers who encounter them perish all to a man. There is not a bird to be seen in the air above, nor an animal on the ground below. Though you look all round most earnestly to find where you can cross, you know not where to make your choice the only mark and indication being the dry bones of the dead left upon the sand. The travellers went westwards towards North India, and they succeeded in getting across and through the range of the Onion Mountains. The snow rests on them both in winter and summer, there are also among them venomous dragons, which, when provoked, spit forth poisonous winds and cause showers of snow and storms of sand and gravel. Not one in ten thousand of those who encounter these dangers escapes with his life. The people of this country call the range by the name of the Snow Mountains. When the travelers had got through them, they were in North India, and immediately on entering its borders found themselves in a small kingdom called Tole, where also there were many monks, all students. The way was difficult and rugged, running along a bank exceedingly precipitous, which rose up there, a hill-like wall of rock, ten thousand cubits from the base. When one approached the edge of it, his eyes became unsteady, and if he wished to go forward in the same direction, there was no place on which he could place his foot, and beneath were the waters of the river called the Indus. In former times, men had chiseled paths along the rocks and distributed ladders on the face of them to the number altogether of seventy, at the bottom of which there was a suspension bridge of ropes by which the river was crossed, its banks being eighty paces apart. From this place they travelled southeast, passing by a succession of very many monasteries, with a multitude of monks, who might be counted by myriads. After passing all these places they came to a country named Ma Tao Lo, where there twenty monasteries, which might contain three thousand monks, and here the law of Buddha was still more flourishing. Everywhere, from the sandy desert, in all the countries of India, the kings had been firm believers of that law. The laws and ways according to which the kings presented their offerings when Buddha was in the world have been handed down to the present day. All south from this is named the Middle Kingdom. In it the cold and heat are finely tempered, and there is neither hoarfrost nor snow. The people are numerous and happy. They do not have to register to cultivate the royal land, but they have to pay a portion of the gain from it. If they want to go, they go. If they want to stay on, they stay. The king governs without decapitation or other corporal punishments. Criminals are simply fined, lightly or heavily, according to the circumstances of each case. Even in cases of repeated attempts at wicked rebellion, they only have their right hands cut off. The kings, bodyguards, and attendants all have salaries. Throughout the whole country, the people do not kill any living creature, nor drink intoxicating liquor, nor eat onions or garlic. The only exception is that of the Chandalas. This is the name for those who are held to be wicked men and live apart from the others. When they enter the gate of a city or a marketplace, they strike a piece of wood to make themselves known, so that men know and avoid them, and do not come into contact with them.
In that country, they do not keep pigs and fowls, and they do not sell live cattle. In the markets, there are no butchers' shops and no dealers in intoxicating drink. In buying and selling commodities, they use cowries. Only the Chandalas are fishermen and hunters, and sell flesh meat. After Buddha attained to Nirvana, the kings of the various countries and the heads of the Vaisyas built viharas for the priests and endowed them with fields, houses, gardens, and orchards, along with the resident populations and their cattle. The grants being engraved on plates of metal, without one daring to annul them, and they remain even to the present time. Having crossed the river and descended south for a yojana, the travellers came to the town of Pataliputra in the kingdom of Magadha, the city where the king Ashoka ruled. The royal palace and halls in the midst of the city, which exist now as of old, were all made by spirits which he employed and which piled up the stones, reared the walls and gates, and executed the elegant carving and inlaid sculpture work in a way in which no human hands of this world could accomplish. The cities and towns of this country are the greatest of all in the Middle Kingdom. The inhabitants are rich and prosperous and vie with one another in the practice of benevolence and righteousness. Every year on the eighth day of the second month, they celebrate a procession of images. They make a four-wheeled car and on it erect a structure of five stories by means of bamboos tied together. This is supported by a king post with poles and lances slanting from it and is rather more than 20 cubits high, having the shape of a taupe. White and silk-like cloth of hair is wrapped all around it, which is then painted in various colours. They make figures of divas with gold, silver and lapis lazuli grandly blended and having silken streamers and canopies hung out over them. There may be 20 cars, all grand and imposing, but each one different from the others. All through the night they keep lamps burning, have skillful music, and present offerings. This is the practice in all of the other kingdoms as well. The heads of the Vaisya families establish in the city's houses for dispensing charity and medicines. All the poor and destitute in the country, orphans, widowers and the childless men, maimed people and cripples and all who are diseased, go to these houses and are provided with every kind of help and doctors examine their diseases. They get food and medicine which their cases require and are made to feel at ease. And when they are better, they go away of themselves. Fashian abode in this country two years. Having obtained his Sanskrit works, he took passage in a large merchantman, on board of which there were more than two hundred men, and to which was attached by a rope to a smaller vessel, as a provision against damage or injury by the large one from the perils of the navigation. With a favourable wind, they proceeded eastwards for three days, and then they encountered a great wind. The vessel sprang a leak, and the water came in. The merchants wished to go to the smaller vessel, but the men on board it, fearing that too many would come, cut the connecting rope. The merchants were greatly alarmed, feeling the risk of instant death. Afraid that the vessel would fill, they took their bulky goods and threw them into the water. Fashian, fearing that the merchants would cast overboard his books and images, he could only think with all his heart, I have travelled far in search of our law. Let me, by your dread and supernatural power, return from my wanderings and reach my resting place. In this way, the tempest continued day and night, till on the thirteenth day the ship was carried to the side of an island, where, on the ebbing of the tide, the place of the leak was discovered, and it was stopped, on which the voyage was resumed. On the sea, thereabouts, there are many pirates, to meet with whom is speedy death. The great ocean spreads out a boundless expanse.
There is no knowing east or west. Only by observing the sun, moon, and stars was it possible to go forward. In the darkness of the night, only the great waves were to be seen, breaking on one another and emitting a brightness like that of fire, with huge turtles and other monsters of the deep all about. The merchants were full of terror, not knowing where they were going. The sea was deep and bottomless, and there was no place where they could drop anchor and stop. But when the sky became clear, they could tell east and west, and the ship again went forward in the right direction. If she had come on any hidden rock, there would have been no way of escape. When I look back on what I have gone through, my heart is involuntarily moved, and the perspiration flows forth. That I encountered danger and trod the most perilous places, without thinking of or sparing myself, was because I had a definite aim, and thought nothing but to do my best in my simplicity and straightforwardness. Thus it was that I exposed my life where death seemed inevitable, if I might accomplish but a ten-thousandth part of what I hoped.